today's scriptures from Matthew 5, 17 to 19, the fulfillment of the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I truly tell you, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will try any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of these, one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Passing on to Peter. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Keep on, keep on. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter, you did an amazing job uh, for your first time putting you on the spot and sharing as well. Um, very good to have you participate in scripture reading. So we've been going through a sermon series on the way of Jesus, which has how many markers? Seven, yes. Um, seven characteristics that Christians should be marked by as we seek to become like the image of Jesus. And just as Pastor Jonathan did a test a couple weeks ago to see if people can remember the markers that we've talked about so far, I'm going to do the same thing. So, which ones have we talked about so far? Today's the fifth one. Does anyone remember the first one? I have begun. I have begun, yes. Amazing. Yes, I have begun following Jesus and depending on the spirit of Jesus in my journey. Beautiful. Anyone remember the second one? Pastor Matthew's not allowed to guess. <laughs> Do you remember? This was the one where um, uh, Sister Deborah had her dinner at over at 270. Oh, yeah, kind of, yeah. I'm being sent by Jesus to bless others and invite him, sorry, invite them to follow him. And the third one, this one was Pastor Jonathan's when they did the washing of the feet. Sorry? ABCs, yeah. I am learning to be like Jesus in my attitudes, behavior, and character, A, B, Cs. I like that. Very good way of remembering. And then last week we had Peter Noyd as a guest speaker. What did he speak about? Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan, yeah. I am learning to love God and love others. And today we're looking at the fifth marker, which is... His teachings, marker number five, his teachings. I am learning the teachings of Jesus. So let's pray that the Lord will guide us today. Dear God, we thank you so much for these seven characteristics that we're going uh, in depth and learning about, Lord. 
we want to be like you, Jesus. And so we just pray that your Holy Spirit will enlighten us. Uh, show us your word and show us how we can live it, Lord. Empower us um, to be like Jesus and to do your word, Lord God. We pray that we won't only be able to be exposed to it and learn it today and forget about it, but that we will be able to live it out. As Sister Deborah was saying, it's not just about Sunday, but it's about every single day. And so, Lord, help us to live this out every single day. We thank you in advance for your revelation to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. This is called, what is this called? Two words. The Great Commission. Yeah. It's God's command, commanded mission, Jesus commanded mission to his disciples, right? Remember, Jesus resurrected, and he was ascending back to the Father, and he left this commission to the disciples, um, which also extends to all believers as well. So all of us who are here today, this extends to us as well. And so part of being a disciple or follower of Jesus is to obey the commands, uh, commandments of Jesus. And you need good communication to get a message across. And if that message requires action, it's important that it's understood and that it's relayed in a clear fashion, right? Baru and I have begun the nesting phase of pregnancy, which means, well, I was first of all looking around in my apartment and I said, there's nothing indicating that a baby is coming. Uh-oh. We better start getting things ready. <laughs> and so we started to get things ready. And one of the first things that we thought we needed to do was get rid of our old, very low couch, which is not very helpful for pregnant ladies to get up from, let me tell you. <laughs> so we thought we need to get a higher one, that one that will be more helpful when there's breastfeeding and all that later on. And so we decided to get rid of the old couch, bring in a new couch, and so when Paolo ordered it, he gave his phone number. Only problem is, he was at work. So how was I going to know when it was going to be delivered? So he was texting me, telling me about every little step uh, that the delivery company was sending to him. They were like, we're just two stops away. He would quickly send it to me. And then when the delivery guys came, they were communicating amongst each other. Four, two, I was like, what are they saying? But they understood what language between them they needed to use in order to be safe with each other. Because, um, you know, one was on one end, the other one was on the other end bringing in the couch. And they needed certain dollies with four wheels and the other one with two wheels. And so they knew. Um, and they were communicating so well among each other. And Paolo and I were communicating so well with each other as well. While he was at work, I was waiting at home for the delivery. And I just thought, wow. This could have been a real big mess between me and Paolo and between the delivery guys if there wasn't good communication with us and if there wasn't good communication between the delivery guys. And so I just thought, whew, thank God for good communication. And part of being a fruitful follower of Jesus is that we need to have good communication um, to understand God's words to us in the Bible. And in this great commission in Matthew 28, we see that the followers are to obey Jesus' commandments. In order to do that, we need to know Jesus' words, good communication. In order to do that, we need to know Jesus as well. This is one of my Bibles from a very long time ago. Um, this was, I guess, one I could put in my purse, very, um, you know, mobile when we didn't have the app and everything like that back then. Um, and so I'm going to flip through it. I know it's very small. What do you notice? <laughs> yes! Oh, <laughs> you guys have such great eyesight. Red letters. Yes, there are 
some red letters in here. And so some of the print in this Bible in the New Testament is red. It's a red letter Bible, which highlights the words of Jesus with red font. The first red letter Bible was printed in 1899. I couldn't believe that. Uh, the original red letter Bible had um, Jesus' teachings in red, but also in the Old Testament, they also had the prophecies that Jesus spoke about in the New Testament in red, and they had the prophecies of Jesus from the Old Testament in red as well. And I thought that was pretty cool because I had only seen New Testaments with red font. And so um, these Bibles became so popular. Uh, who's had one of these before? Red letter Bibles. Yeah, lots of people, lots of people have had them. Um, they became so popular because it's so special to see Jesus' words highlighted. But we can't be fooled into thinking that the red letter words consist of Jesus' only teachings. Yes, these are his teachings from his time on earth. But it's important to recognize that Jesus' words in the color red also tie into the entire Bible. There are many times when we've been offered, I'm going to make a confession here, and I don't know if Pastor Matthew's going to get mad at me, but been called and said, hey, can we offer your church or, um, you know, like a hundred New Testaments with red letters? And I'm like, no, sorry, we want the whole Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry, we need the whole Bible. We can't just have half of it. And so I've turned it down because it's really important that we not only have a part of the Bible, but it's so important for us to have the whole thing. And so 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The whole Bible was inspired by God and are God's words. Jesus is God. So what he taught in the New Testament doesn't contradict what was said in the Old Testament, but rather Jesus' teachings actually bring revelation, life, and true interpretation of the Old Testament. I love to think about a red thread being weaved through scripture from beginning to end, it's all related. There's a red thread from beginning to end. We need the New Testament to understand the Old Testament, and we need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. So when this way of Jesus marker talks about Jesus' teachings, it's about knowing the whole word of God and how Jesus interpreted it. Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. They didn't have, it wasn't called the Old Testament. They would call it the law and prophets. So that's what he's saying here. I haven't come to abolish the Old Testament. I haven't come to abolish the law and prophets. I have, I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke, of a letter will pass away from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of these least commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't counter the law. He didn't counter the Old Testament. It may have looked like it, and this is why he was challenged by the teachers of the Old Testament law all the time. They'd come up to him, tap their foot, cross their arms, and be like, mm -hmm, what do you have to say about that? What do you think about this question? And they tried to test him all the time. Um, and he, yeah, he'd just be questioned by them. And so it looked like he was contradicting uh, the Old Testament, but he wasn't. The way that Jesus interpreted and taught the Old Testament was mind-blowing because it was so different from what was being taught in Judaism at the time that it seemed wrong. How many of you have 
have learned something, that you were doing something that was wrong the whole time. Um, yeah, but, but then was you were corrected. You were like, oh, yeah, I think we all have, right? And so, you know, this is what Jesus was trying to do, um, was trying to be like, hey, it's not the way that you've been teaching it, it's not the way that you've been believing it, but it's like this. And so, I don't know if some of you have seen uh, posts online, uh, if you are a social media person, and they're called, I was today years old when I learned, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> These posts are dedicated to discovering little life hacks or facts that the person never knew or had never been taught. For example, did you know that your stove drawer was meant to keep the food hot back in the day when most meals were cooked in the oven? Now it's a great pan drawer. <laughs> or did you know that the black and white movie in Home Alone wasn't a real movie? It was just clip made for that movie. Or did you know that babies have more bones than an adult? I gave this revelation to Bono. He was like, did not know this. <laughs> and I know these are silly little facts, but Jesus was really hoping that the teachers of the law and everybody else would have various I was today years old moments when they realized who he was. Imagine if they could have learned and posted this Back in the day, I was today years old when I realized that Jesus is the Son of God. I was today years old when I realized the New Testament doesn't contradict the Old Testament. I was today years old when I realized Jesus' teachings were in line with the Old Testament teachings. Some were able to see this, but many were not in Jesus' day. And this is why Jesus would get frustrated. And I truly can imagine him rolling his eyes and just being like, oh, you foolish generation, how much longer am I supposed to put up with you? And just nodding his head and just being like, oh. <laughs> because this would just be ongoing for him. The proof was right in front of their eyes. Their creator was in the flesh speaking to them. And many still didn't want to believe. Now do you understand why believing is such a big deal, especially those who believe without seeing? It's a big deal. And let me share with you this quote that I read this past week as I prepared for the sermon. I'm going to read you the larger quote in context. Jesus is showing us that we must read the scriptures in a way that reflects the redemptive heart of God. Love of God and love of others is the interpretive key. Oh, sorry, did I? Interpretive key, yes. Uh, the overarching teaching that guides us, we call the great commandment. And that's from Matthew 22, 35. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? This is um, what Peter Noy was sharing with us last week. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Last week we had Peter speaking about this, this uh, topic, loving God and loving others. And this is how Jesus lived and calls us to live. But furthermore, this is how we are supposed to interpret scriptures as well. Jesus summed up the entire law. Does anyone know how many laws there were? 613. One, we have one guess here. Anybody else? A lot. A lot, <laughs> yeah. 613 is what... Um, what some in Judaism say there is. Uh, and so there were more than 600 laws. He wasn't just referring to the Ten Commandments, but Jesus summed up the entire law by saying, love God and love others. Jesus really hoped the Pharisees would have realized this. He really would have hoped that they would have said, I was today years old when I realized the law is summed up simply by loving God and loving others. 
This quote there on the screen blew my mind this week because I realized that this is how Jesus interpreted the whole Old Testament with love so that it could be redemptive in people's lives. I had only thought of this interpretation um, of Jesus towards the laws, not the whole Old Testament. So for me, this was really mind blowing. So I'm just gonna repeat this. Love of God and love of others is the interpretive key. Jesus interpreted the Old Testament with love so that it carried out redemptive purposes. The teachers of the law in Jesus' day were using the law to condemn people and to moralize them. But Jesus was using the law redemptively. Let's think back on the ser Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The way he interpreted the Old Testament and lifted up the person that would normally be dragged by religion, that was revolutionary. Jesus spoke about the poor in spirit, the meek, the victims of adultery. He spoke about how to love God and live like someone who loves him by loving our enemies and being secretly generous. Love and loving the unlovable was always at the core of what he taught. Let's look at two examples from the Sermon of the Mount uh, and how love was at the core of his teaching. Matthew 5, you have heard it said that you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. To murder someone is to dehumanize the person and to be overtaken by one's own emotion or agenda, and that is unloving. I think we can all agree with that. In the same way, Jesus explains that to get angry with someone, uh-oh, <laughs> to get angry with someone is along the same lines of murdering, uh, murdering someone because we're dehumanizing the person and we're putting our emotions and our agenda first, and that's unloving. Wow. If we had more time, I would explain that anger isn't a sinful emotion. And sometimes being angry with someone is justified, for example, if they hurt someone or hurt someone else. But this is not what Jesus is referring to. He's referring to anger that is not justified. Let's look at another Sermon on the Mount sample. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman or a man lustfully has already committed adultery with them in their heart. Jesus takes the law further than it has ever been understood, even by the most educated of his day. And he was able to do this with his interpretation of scripture through the lens of redemptive love. To Jesus, adultery and lust are explained as the same thing because they both dehumanize and objectify the person for the singular use of sex. And that is unloving. And this was mind blowing for all who were listening to this. So much so that it says when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Jesus taught to redeem and not to condemn. Redemption brings life. John 10.10 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance, said Jesus. If you think that Jesus came to suck the life out of you and condemn you, you're wrong. He's come to bring life. In John 6, many of Jesus' followers were taken back by his bold teaching, so much so that they decided to leave him. Jesus turned to the rest of them who stayed, and he said, do you want to leave me too? And Simon Peter, I just love his answer. He says, Lord, to who are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus and his words and his teachings, they bring life. They are meant to redeem and not to condemn. Do you believe it? Do you understand that his words are not meant to beat you down, but they're meant to redeem you? 
So if Christ's teachings bring life and his interpretation of the scriptures are interpreted with the lens of redemptive love, how are we supposed to use the scriptures in the same way, with redemptive love? Philippians 1.9 says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth and insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Jesus gave us so many practical examples, uh, and we have more in the New Testament as well, on how to love others and, and be redeeming in, in our behavior, forgiving others, being generous, serving the lowly, being patient, doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. God's desire is that we abound in love. And this is what we as followers of Jesus are called to do, to know his teachings, interpret the scriptures like Jesus did, and live them out in the way that he did, in redemptive love. I was speaking with a pastor who told me that a long time ago, there was a leader at his church who had a baby out of wedlock. And of course, it was expect unexpected and shocking to the congregation. And some of the church members pressured the pastor to discipline her by taking away her leadership privileges. He prayed and thought about what would be the most redemptive thing that could be done for this leader. And he decided, keep her in leadership, officiate her wedding, and have the child involved in the life of the church. And he got major backlash for it. And so, ooh, sorry, I have lost my pages. I have grown up in church, and I have, I have never seen that done. So when he told me, I was shocked. <laughs> I have never seen a pastor do that. The regular route that I've seen um, is that the leader would have been disciplined and if they showed that they were repentant while correcting their lifestyle, they'd be able to come back to leadership. But many don't come back because they feel ashamed and judged. So the outcome in that situation that the pastor told me about was redemptive. If you look back at the woman who was caught in adultery and Jesus' reaction, he was being pressured by the crowd to condemn her and stone her because this is what the law prescribed. But Jesus acted redemptively and forgave her sins. Every situation is different. It doesn't mean that we're gonna let leaders' sinful behavior slide every time Every situation requires a different approach. In the example I've shared with you, that the pastor shared with me, that was the most redemptive thing that could have been done for that person. In another situation, the most redemptive thing for a leader who has sinned is probably that they step down and that the victims who have been hurt by the leader could be nurtured by the church. Every situation is different. Whatever the situation is, love will help us to discern what is the right thing to do. That's what the Philippians passage says. I just added that before, before preaching, so I didn't get to add it to my PowerPoint. Um, but that Philippians passage says that love is going to help us discern um, what to do. And this is why the Apostle Paul was praying that the church would learn the depths of knowledge when it came to love. Because it's going to help us to decide what's the best situation, I mean, what's the best thing for me to do in this situation. So this is a question we can ask ourselves in situations when we're seeking to apply Jesus' teaching in our lives. What would Jesus do? Okay. How would Jesus view this person? How would Jesus direct my emotions right now? What is the most loving thing to do? What can be a redemptive outcome? Can I do it with the power of the Spirit? Jesus said, in John 6, 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Jesus' teachings bring life. They are meant to redeem. Amen. This includes the teaching from the Old Testament. 
those teachings are supposed to point us to need Christ. They tell us we couldn't fulfill the law and be righteous. So we need the perfect and righteous one, Jesus. The only one who could fill, fulfill the whole law. A follower of Jesus should be marked by the teachings of love. The teachings of Jesus. To know the teachings, to do the teachings, and to teach others to obey them as well. But let's not fall into the same mistake as the teachers of the law. They prioritized living moral lives, squeaky clean lives, but didn't know the true God. They couldn't recognize the Messiah when he was right in front of them. Let's teach people about who Jesus is first, and then his teachings. And the Spirit will help us to live out those teachings in love. It's not the other way around. We can't convert people by telling them to be obedient. No one wants to be obedient to someone they don't know. The person needs to know Jesus first. And as for you, who does know Jesus, we're on a journey of learning to live out Christ's teachings. Know that you are not alone. You have God the Holy Spirit living inside of you, giving you the power to live out Christ's teachings and to do all things with love for God and others. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much because this is a really tough thing to do. It's easy to learn it. It's easy to memorize it, to read it, and even understand it, God. Um, but it's really hard to do. And so, Lord, we just pray, just like Paul prayed for the Philippian uh, church, he said that you will know the depths of love so that you will be able to discern what is pure and righteous. God, help us to know the depths of love. Help us to understand, Lord God, so that not only we will live out love, but that we will also, um, that it will just spread in our relationship and our friendship with others, God, as we speak to them, as we, um, yeah, just uh, live life with them, Lord God. We pray that we will be able to know what to do in situations that are really tough, uh, when it's really hard to love someone, Lord God. Help us to know what to do, Lord. Help us to be kind and to be patient in that moment, Lord. Help us to know how to live out your word redemptively, God. Help us to follow the example of Jesus. We thank you so much for your word, Lord God, and we know that you never ask us to do something that we can't. We can do this with the power of your spirit. We can do this because God is living inside of us, giving us, Lord God, that boldness, that empowerment um, to be able to do it. So we thank you, Lord God, that we are not alone. If it was up to us, we would fail but we know that you are with us and you give us the victory, Lord. So we thank you in advance for this growth that you will give us in love and that we will be able to love others well, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.